to the presentation again. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. Um, we will be getting going in just uh, two minutes. So thanks for everybody for joining. We will be getting going in just one minute. Yeah, we uh, had to stand up. All right, so we'll get started. Um, so I just wanted to uh, welcome everybody to the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society of Canada's virtual cooking class. Um, this is part of our acute leukemia conference series today. So, so thank you all so much for attending. Um, my name is Charlotte Hall Coates. I'm the Community Services Manager for the Atlantic Region. And uh, I'm really excited to be uh, introducing today's event. Uh, before we get going, I just have a few housekeeping notes. Um, this event will last approximately 60 minutes and will include a question and answer period at the very end. Um, since we have quite a few people joining us today, um, if you could please uh, type in your questions in the Q&A box um, at the bottom of your window, um, that would be great. And we'll try to get at, to as many questions as we can. Um, we also do have a chat uh, box, um, but we do ask that uh, if you can, please use the Q&A section instead. Uh, sometimes the chat gets a little hard to follow. Um, so before we begin um, the session, uh, I just want to go over a few um, resources and supports we have available through the LLSC, um, as well as just highlight our mission. So, um, uh, at the LLC, our mission is to cure blood cancers and support uh, those living with blood cancers as well as uh, caregivers, family, and the whole community. Um, we also offer guidance um, and support at every step of the way. Uh, we know that the current situation prevents many challenges to those affected by blood cancer and their families. Uh, we have community services managers in each region uh, to help. Uh, please do not hesitate to contact the LLC if you need any information or support. Um, you can reach us at info at bloodcancers.ca or give us a call at 1-833-222-4884. Uh, we'll also be recording this um, podcast, or sorry, this webcast. So um, if you ever uh, miss something or if you wanna go back and uh, rewatch it, it will be made available. We also offer a variety of education resources and support services to help um, those affected by blood cancers. They include uh, fact sheets and videos and booklets, um, including uh, some information on uh, nutrition and food. Um, we also have a, a podcast series uh, called The Blood Cancer Experience, um, where you can uh, tune in and hear from other uh, other people um, who have experience with blood cancer. We also have information on research and, uh, and different types of treatments. Um, so you can um, tune in to the blood cancer experience. It's available on Spotify and Apple podcasts or anywhere that you enjoy listening to your podcasts. 
We also have our webcasts available um, on our website. So you can go to bloodcancers.ca slash webcasts. Um, they're available um, uh, including all of our archived uh, webcasts. So you can uh, see some of our previous webcasts as well as learn about some of our upcoming webcasts as well. And then the last program I want to highlight is our peer support program. Um, so this is a program designed for individuals um, who are either newly diagnosed with a blood cancer or going through um, you know, changes in their blood cancer as well as their caregivers, family, friends. Um, we do have volunteers available for you to connect with um, and hear about their experience um, uh, dealing with a similar type of, of, um, of blood cancer. And finally, I wanted to uh, give out a special thank you to Estellas uh, for generously supporting um, this event. So I'm now gonna pass it over to Robin and Gail uh, from Simply for Life. Um, Gail and Robin both share a passion for nutrition and healthy living and strive to help their clients meet and achieve their health goals, including the focus on the focus of healthy, nutritious foods and staying active. So over to you, Robin and Gail. Hi everyone, um, thanks for joining us today. I'm uh, Robin is on her way down. Um, I'm Gail and I'm the owner of Simply for Life uh, in St. John's, Newfoundland. And uh, if you don't know much about Simply for Life, uh, we're a nutrition company. We also have natural food markets um, in our clinics and, uh, oh, here comes Robin. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, we, uh, we specialize in all types of different nutrition consulting. We get a lot of people that come to see us for weight loss, but we see tons of people for all kinds of issues, you know, anything that falls under the umbrella of nutrition, really sports nutrition, blood pressure, diabetes, diabetes and all kinds of things. Things. sports nutrition, all kinds of stuff. So, um, yeah, so today we're going to do a little presentation for everybody. It's going to be a little cooking demo slash information session. Um, we're going to make a few of our most popular uh, recipes that everyone loves. And we think that would be, um, you know, a good fit uh, for anyone who's kind of looking for, you know, healthier eating. Um, so we're going to do a granola, uh, which is great. You can keep this, um, you know, it's good for a few weeks. Uh, and we're also going to make a smoothie recipe. And smoothie sounds really um, basic, but most of the time when we get clients sign up with us, we'll say, you know, what are you having to eat? And a lot of people will say, well, I'm having smoothies. And then we'll mention to them, well, what, what are you putting in your smoothies? A lot of the time it's just going to be um, like a lot of sugar, a lot of carbohydrates. It's not really going to give you any lasting energy. Um, if people are looking to gain weight, a smoothie is a great way to um, you know, uh, to get more in without, without eating a whole lot. And um, it's easy digestible. Very good for digestion. Yeah, if you're having trouble digesting, um, you know, if you're getting full really quick. Um, and you can create like a fully balanced meal from a smoothie. So we're yeah. just going to talk to you guys um, when we get to the smoothie session about how to build a good smoothie, what kind of things you should be looking for. Um, you know, if you're interested in, if you're kind of maybe struggling to get uh, three meals in every day, that kind of thing, um, how you can amp up the calories to, to create a lot or to create a lot of fullness and yeah. to give you more energy um, through a pretty easy vehicle. Yeah. And same with the granola. It's a good way to sort of incorporate more calorie dense things um, that can help keep you full for a lot longer and help keep your energy, keep your energy going. Yep. Yeah. Um, so we're going to start, if you guys are cooking along, we're going to start with the granola just so we can get that going, get it in the oven. And then Robin does have some information then um, on food safety. Yep. So we'll go through that a little bit and then we'll finish off with our smoothie. And I've got these really great coconut bowls. So I'm going to show you guys at the end how you can turn your smoothie into more of like an ice cream almost, like a smoothie bowl. And that's really nice, like especially if you have issues, you know, your, if your mouth is hurting and things like that. Um, it's nice to have cool things like ice cream, but this is, this will just be the nutrient dense version yeah. of an ice cream. So, um, yeah, so we're going to get started. So if you're cooking along, you want to just preheat your oven, put it on about 375 and you, you'll need a cooking, like a baking sheet. This is my super old one that I've had for like 25 <laughs> years. Um, it's almost like a cast iron pan now, like if nothing sticks to it, but if you've got like a new pan or something, you can. You can use parchment or wax paper um, to put your girl on. It's just easier too for cleanup. So get have those things ready. And then um, we're also gonna use 
like a, we're gonna need a burner as well. So I'm just gonna move some things over. So what we're gonna do is kind of have like a dry and a wet. So some of the ingredients that we'll be working with today, we've got some thick rolled oats. Um, this is kind of the best thing when you wanna make a granola. Um, they hold up better. The quick cooking oats can sometimes like burn up in the oven, disintegrate a bit more. Seal cut oats don't really, they don't grab onto the different flavors. Like when you, when we make the wet part and we coat everything, I find steel coat, steel cut doesn't really, you know, it's very nutritious, but it doesn't exactly make for, pick up all the flavors, yeah. So we're gonna use a, uh, a gluten-free thick rolled oat. You don't have to use gluten-free unless you're dealing with um, gluten issues. Um, so any type of thick rolled oat will do, and there's gonna be about three cups of that. And you'll notice that I don't measure anything. It's really bad, but I can kind of eyeball it. But if you're gonna, you're gonna be making this recipe, you can definitely measure it out. So like three cups will go in here. And you can like, you can half this recipe if you're only making enough for yourself or one or two people for, you know, a few days. But you can also double it, triple it if you want to um, make bigger batches. Do this a lot at Christmas time and give it out as presents. So. Um, so yeah, that's our rolled oats. So we're gonna get those in. And what we're gonna get started on the stove here, we just need a burner. Yep. Um, you're just, just, we're just gonna get our, um, our liquids going. So I actually didn't have it in the recipe and I apologize, but I just had honey, I think, or maple syrup, but I actually add a little bit of butter as well. So if you have butter on hand and you're cooking along, um, I use about a quarter of a cup of butter. You can also use coconut oil, or you can use a very neutral oil, like a light tasting olive oil. You wouldn't want to use a, you wouldn't want to use another oil that would have a stronger flavor, like a full flavored olive oil or anything like that, because you get too much flavor into your granola. But a neutral, something like butter or a uh, light tasting olive oil or coconut oil works really well. So we're just going to add that in and add honey. <laughs> I had honey. A quarter of a cup. Oh, yeah. So a quarter of a cup of honey as well that we're just going to add in to melt. Thank you. And you can use maple syrup if you're making like a vegan version. Um, Maple syrup is good. Uh, I find it does give you that more of like a maple -y flavor, obviously. So just on like a medium heat, you're just gonna melt that away. So this is the time I wrote ginger powder in the recipe. Um, so this is the time then that you can add in your ginger as well. So you can add in about a teaspoon. Now I have, I actually have a like a gin, like a, like a candy ginger. You can also use something like that. And ginger is great because it's really good for settling your stomach. Um, so you can make like, you can make all kinds of different things with ginger. So you can get the fresh ginger, the ginger root. You can get that in the supermarket. It's usually over by the garlic. And you can, um, and what you can do with that is you can uh, just take the peel off and grate it and you can steep it in some hot water. Um, you can put it in like a chicken soup base. You can put it in a bone broth. Anything like that is really soothing for the stomach. Um, if you're dealing with like a lot of nausea, um, anything like that. Um, it's great. It's a great addition to things, you know, that you're sipping on. You can have, and there's lots of ginger teas as well. And so I'm just chopping up this candy ginger, but you guys can add your ginger powder if that's what you're using right in. Or if you're using fresh ginger, you can use that as well. Powder is always more concentrated, so you'll just use a little bit less of the fresh. But if you hate the flavor of ginger, you can leave it out. You can add in like a pinch of cinnamon, nutmeg, um, allspice, anything like that would work really well. Um, so yeah, you're just gonna sort of like let it steep a little bit. So I'm just gonna turn that down on a lower setting. I think that's as it goes. Um, yeah, so we've got, uh, so we've put together our dry now. So we've got all of our oats in here. And I think I actually added too many this time. That's okay. Um, I also asked you guys to get some uh, unsweetened coconut. So this one here actually toasted. So if you'd like to toast your, if you make this recipe again and you want to toast it, now it does toast up in the oven anyway, so it will sort of come out like this. But I always keep a big batch of toasted 
um, coconut at my house anyway, because it's great to add to things like granola, even top smoothie bowls. Um, on my kids like it on top of yogurt. Um, so all kinds of stuff like that. It just has like lots and lots of flavor. Coconut's really good, um, just in general. Um, lots of nice healthy fats. So uh, we're gonna put in about a cup of that. The only thing with the coconut in the granola when you have it in the oven is you really gotta watch your oven because coconut can burn up really quick. And especially where I already have this pre-toasted, um, it can definitely burn up quicker. So, yeah, let's turn it off. All right, so we've got those guys in there. I like to give like a nice pinch of salt as well. This is sea salt. You can use any type of salt that you like really, but I like the flaky sea salt. All right, and then, so I mess, I, when I gave you guys the ingredients, I said some sort of like a tropical fruit, mango or dry, dried mango, dried pineapple, anything like that. You can even use golden raisins. You can use, you can use whatever you like. Cranberries is also really nice. Whatever you like that's on hand. Um, I sort of have like this mixture of things. So it's got some pineapple and some mango. It actually has some dried coconut, which is nice. So adding the dried coconut is another way to kind of boost the caloric values. You're finding that you're struggling to kind of keep, uh, you know, enough food in, I think. Um, coconut has a good, you know, good healthy fat source, but it's also an easy way to add um, caloric density. You could also throw in some nuts or seeds or something like that as well. Yeah, so I really like in this recipe, um, macadamia nuts go really well. And macadamia nuts have lots of great... Um, great amount mono monounsaturated fats in them and they're very filling and uh, they're just great in a recipe in any sort of tropical recipe like this so you're going to do about half a cup to a cup depending on you know how much you want in there um so we're just going to toss that around just sort of incorporate all that granola is super easy to make um once you start making it you probably won't want to go back to store-bought because it's so good how you can control you know, uh, what goes in there, how much sugar is in there, all that kind of stuff. And yeah, you can load it up with all your favorites. So use this recipe as more of a base. Um, and then you can add, you know, more of the things that you like into it. So now we're going to take our wet. And we're just going to pour it all over. Pour it into your dry. And then I'm just going to toss it. Just want it to be covered. And if you don't think you gave enough of a pinch of salt last time, you can definitely add a little bit more because now it will really stick on there. And don't be afraid to add some sodium because your body does need that. Um, oh, I almost forgot an ingredient. So, um, what I always love to add to pretty much everything that I make, smoothies and granola and, oh, sorry. Oh, the two. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's Robin. Um, we almost forgot about the chia or the flax. Do you want to talk to them a bit about the chia and flax or psyllium? Sure. So there's um, chia and flax and psyllium are all really good sources of fiber. Um, they're also chia and flax in particular are good sources of omega threes. So if fish is not your game, <laughs> or if you're not particularly feeling fish at certain times, um, they're a really good plant based source of omega threes, which are really healthy for the body, anti inflammatory, um, good brain food. So I guess we're going to use uh, a little bit of. This is actually an Epicure mix. I really like the Epicure mixes. So if you guys know anyone who's selling that, um, this is the Tutti Fruity. This one contains psyllium, but you can use your own chia. You can use about a tablespoon. One to two tablespoons in this recipe should be good. Um, the fibers are really good for helping to kind of clump things together as well. Yes. So the fibers in the, the psyllium or the chia or the flax um, will help everything sort of stick together and inside your body sort of does the same thing. It's a gelling fiber. So if you are having issues with say constipation, 
um, it's a good good way to sort of um, get things moving along. And psyllium actually, even if you're kind of experiencing in the other direction, some looser stools, psyllium actually helps to kind of create some solidity to the stool. So pretty much your, your gelling fibers like your chia and flax and uh, psyllium are good for kind of your overall, good for your gut, no matter what you might be kind of struggling with, they're really uh, beneficial. So once you've got it all covered and you think it's all, um, it's all nicely mixed up. You can just lay it flat onto your baking sheet. Smell good. <laughs> and like I said, you can use this as sort of a base to making granola, like add the flavors you like. If you like maple and almonds, you can use maple syrup instead of honey. Uh, you can add slivered almonds. You can like walnuts are really nice in granola. Um, all kinds of good stuff. So I'll just Get it flat onto your baking sheet. Best you can. Just spread it out so it's really even. I don't know if you guys can see me. You just want to spread it out so that it's so that it's all even. It's not too clumped up in one area or another. And you will have to kind of keep your eye to it, guys. Um, because like I said, stuff can burn up quickly. So you wanna every you know five minutes or so, just pick your eyes in and just stir it around. Uh, if it's getting too brown in a certain spot because no one wants to have burnt granola, yuck. All right, so yeah, my granola just looks spread out. So we're gonna stick it in the oven now and uh, I'll just keep checking on it. And Robin's gonna give you guys a bit of info now about food safety. Well, Charlotte, if it's all right, I'm just gonna log into the Zoom here on my computer. <laughs> so we might have to mute uh, our main screen here. I think that's what I was getting some feedback there in between. Yeah, no problem. I just uh, muted your camera. So whenever you wanna log in uh, for the presentation. Perfect. Oh, see, so I'm still getting it back. Maybe if we log out. <laughs> okay, so I do need to be able to share my screen. I think I'm uh, disabled from share screen. There you go, you can go right ahead. Perfect. Okay. All right. So, how can I move these controls here? Perfect slideshow. That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> Do that. Okay, guys, so um, as they had, as Charlotte and Gail both mentioned, so I am going to cover a couple topics with you guys today, just some things on food safety. We're also going to chat a little bit on digestion, so some tips for good digestion when your digestion isn't feeling 100%. Um, and then lastly, we're going to touch on a little tiny info on, uh, on hydration as well. So um, just to cover our focus points here, so we are going to talk about food safety. Um, a lot of these concepts I'm sure um, you've heard of before, things like cross-contamination. Um, we are going to talk about, are going to talk about proper cooking and cooling procedures, proper storage of foods, um, and foods to avoid during treatment. So if you are immunocompromised at the time, um, things that we would want to avoid at that time. Um, I am going to touch a little bit on uh, unregulated foods as well and, and why they pose a danger to us. Um, and we're going to touch on supporting some good digestion and hydration. So I'm going to hop right in here. And if you guys have any questions about any of these topics whatsoever, I am going to provide um, Charlotte with some resources for you guys and a copy of the slideshow as well. Um, but of course, feel free to use the Q&A at the end of the session to ask any clarifying questions on the topics. So... Why is it important that we are aware of foodborne illness? So 
everybody should be aware of foodborne illnesses and how they how they come in contact with our foods but especially when you're going through treatment or recovering from treatment if our immune system is not functioning at its best um, things that would be things that might not make us sick in our healthiest state can certainly make us sick when we have um, when we're immunocompromised so um, what I'm going to chat a little bit about with you guys today is how can we identify where um, foodborne illness can contaminate our foods all the way from our grocery store shelf to our plate. So first concept I'm going to chat with you guys a little bit about is the danger zone. So I'm not sure if you guys have ever heard of the danger zone before, but basically what the danger zone is, is the area between cooking temperatures and refrigerator temperatures where bacteria are growing rapidly when we expose foods to those temperatures. So for example, foods that are in your refrigerator, you know, we, we know that they last for a certain amount of time, or when we're cooking our foods, we're cooking them in a nice high temperature where bacteria are not alive, but between 60 degrees Celsius and four degrees Celsius is what we call the danger zone. And this is where bacteria that are naturally present in the air and in our foods can multiply at a rate where the concentration of bacteria can actually make us become sick. So if you, for example, take out uh, food to thaw and you lay it on your counter, obviously that's our counter, our room temperature is around 20 degrees. So it's a, you know, it's a definitely a temperature that would fall within the danger zone. So we have to be mindful of how long our foods sit out on our room, in our room temperatures and things like that. So the danger zone, basically, um, Foods should ideally never spend more than two hours within the danger zone because two hours of exposure to these temperatures is likely when we reach an amount of bacteria that can actually cause us to become sick. So how do we stay safe? How do we prevent ourselves from getting sick with foodborne illness? We have to take a look at our food's entire journey from our grocery store, from the shelf, to our cart, to our car, our home and refrigerator, our prep spaces before we eat our foods that we're properly cooking, properly cooling, properly storing, and also reheating our foods in a safe way. So we're gonna just kind of break this down into a few tips for each, each area. So from our shelf in the grocery store to our fridge, how can we stay safe? Make sure that your foods that you're purchasing are within their expiry when you pick them up at the grocery store. Um, also make sure that the packaging that things are in um, hasn't been damaged before you pick up the product. Store raw meats in your cart away from ready to eat produce like rotisserie chicken, fresh fruits and vegetables. This is something that my husband is absolutely notorious for. Every time we go shopping together, um, I have to kind of bat his hand away and kind of keep separating all of the meats, all the raw meats from the, the finished vegetables, especially things like baby carrots that we're gonna just be kind of taking them straight out of the bag and dipping in that kind of thing. He's notorious for, uh, for falling down on this one. <laughs> Plan to grocery shop and head straight home or arrange to have a cooler for storing your refrigerated items in your car. We want to make sure that when we're leaving the grocery store, with especially with refrigerator foods, our frozen foods do kind of, you know, last cool, stay cool for a little bit longer. But certainly our milk products and cheeses, raw meats are certainly things that we want to make sure we're kind of getting them right home when we grocery shop. And if you are farther away from a grocery store, um, bringing a cooler with you in your car could be a good way, especially in the summertime, to make sure that we're, we're hitting the mark on that. So, and when you do go home, store your cold and frozen items promptly in your fridge or freezer. Again, something me and my husband argue about who has to put away the groceries, but it does need to get done right away when you get home. And periodically checking that your refrigerator temps are at four degrees or below and that your freezer is minus 18 and below. These two temperatures are really where we should see our refrigerators. I know minus 18 is fairly cold for a freezer, but that's actually a lot of the lifetime um, recommendations for how long you keep your meats and things um, are based on that 18 degrees and below. So there should be a little dial in your refrigerator and your freezer that can kind of tell you what the temperature is. And I mean, you can always invest in a cheap thermometer from, uh, from Walmart or the grocery store that you'd be able to pop into your freezer as well. Yeah, you can buy them online too for Amazon and they're like $8. Dollars. You can order them on Amazon as well. <laughs> I know some people are still in lockdown right now. <laughs> So your preparation space and proper cooking. So make sure that your counters and your hands, of course, are clean prior to prepping your foods. Early washing all your fruits and veggies before consumption are important. Um, 
Ah, meats in the refrigerator, not on your counter. Um, so remember the danger zone. We certainly don't want to have uh, a meat product or a uh, product that could grow, you know, bacteria fairly quickly sitting on your counter. Even after you cook your food, some of the bacteria that are present in our environment um, are not fully destroyed by the cooking process. So it's still really important to make sure that we're not spending that two hours plus in the danger zone. So something that this always kind of brought me back to um, was turkey dinners growing up. So I remember my mother thawing her turkeys in the sink all the time, um, you know, and I just, I guess they kind of had that pass down mentality that, oh, well, it never made anyone sick before. So we probably, it was, it's probably fine, right? So um, she used to pop even just uh, chicken breasts or whatever she had for, for suppers in, in the sink in a cold water, um, but leave it there for hours and hours. And I would say, okay, well, the water is cold, but if you're not constantly running that cold water, the temperature is becoming a danger zone temperature. So we've got to be conscious. Put her turkey out on her counter for two days. Oh! <laughs> for two days. And while you might think that the center of the meat is frozen, obviously the surface of yeah. the meat itself has been exposed to a high temperature and has had all kinds of opportunity to grow lots and lots of bacteria to make us sick. So preparing risk containing items. So your raw eggs, your meat, things like that in separate space and separate utensils from any other foods. Um, this is definitely something that a lot of people are aware of. However, one of the most common places that people get sick in the summertime is when they are not cleaning their barbecue utensils in between. So if you have a chicken breast laid on your barbecue and you decide to brush sauce on there and then you're flipping over your chicken and you keep coming back and brushing with the same brush, you've touched your raw meat and you're recontaminating it every time you come back and brush again. So be conscious of the tongs. That fight with my in-laws. <laughs> every time I go over there, I like grab the brush and go wash it off before they can do it again. <laughs> and again, I feel like there's a lot of, you know, I feel, I feel like it's a, yeah, it's an older generation thing sometimes, but I also feel like it's, it's, you know, uh, that false sense of security that, you know, it's never made you sick before, but that still doesn't mean we can kind of risk it, especially when we're immunocompromised. So cooking your foods to proper temperatures and avoiding raw egg yolks. Um, I'm actually I'm pregnant and this is something that I'm not allowed to eat raw egg yolks either. And I love my eggs runny. So <laughs> something to be conscious of. So I do have a resource for you guys that I will send out in a little package. Um, just a, a quick note notation on proper temperatures for internal uh, temps for cooking. And my my meats and foods have never tasted better since I invested in a, uh, a small kitchen thermometer. We never ever had them growing up. So our meats were always pretty much like a leather boot or yeah, <laughs> pretty much a leather boot. Um, but yeah, so proper cooking temperatures not only can have uh, you know better results for how your food tastes, but also can keep you safe. So everything should be cooked to a well done state um, when we're trying to avoid foodborne illness. So cooling and proper storage of foods. This is certainly an area, um, you know, when we do our food handling courses uh, through school, this was an area that they've spent a lot of time on. Um, a lot of people do check to make sure that their temperatures are where they should be when they're cooking foods, but proper cooling and proper storage of foods can sometimes be a little bit tangly. So it is possibly the most important step. It's because it's an often overlooked step in keeping ourselves safe. So your food, if we think about that danger zone again, um, your food must come from its cooked temperature down below out of that danger zone to below four degrees. So in that in that refrigerated temperature within two hours of cooking or removal from heat. That's again to just make sure that we're not spending all that time in the area where where bacteria has that opportunity to grow to, to, to make us sick. So again, turkey dinner <laughs> brings me back to my childhood. My mom used to leave her turkey out on the counter for four or five hours after we were eating before she'd even start breaking it down. And that's certainly a no-no. This is something you wanna get broken down right away to kind of pop pop in the uh, pop in the fridge. Soups and stews, um, they can be a little bit difficult. Uh, you know, if you have a big pot of chili and you're taking that giant pot of chili and you're popping it into a refrigerator, oftentimes while the surface of the chili might be getting cooled, it certainly can stay for hours and hours and hours. It can still like for, eight to 10 hours after if you have a large pot placed down in the fridge, it can be, it can take that long for it really to cool down to a, a safe temperature. So we do have to be wary that we don't just throw the pot in there um, of our soup or our stew or anything like that. So I always use, when I'm preparing soups and stews, we always take out our bowls that we're gonna eat for the evening. And then we start with our leftovers right away by storing them in more shallow containers. So that allows for the air to uh, 
to circulate a little bit better. Sorry, guys. That's okay. Um, if you guys are doing the granola, I just checked mine. It's really like a golden brown color. If yours is like that, you can take it out now. If not, you can give it another couple minutes, but really keep an eye on it because mine was like the edges around and sides <laughs> are almost getting to that burnt texture. So um, if you're making the granola, go check on Here's it. Here's your check. Yeah. And if it's looking very goldeny brown, just pop it out and stir it up and leave it on your stove to cool. It smells absolutely delicious in here right now. <laughs> I'll give you guys maybe a second to go check on your granola. Okay. And don't feel bad if you burn your granola because the first few times I made granola, I scorched it. It was <laughs> inedible, so it's really trial and error. So don't, don't beat yourself up if this batch ended up going in the garbage. A little bit browner <laughs> yeah. than normal. <laughs> Okay, so sometimes too with things, hot things like thick and hot foods like soups and stews and chilies, um, I'll also employ the freezer sometimes. So taking my containers if they're really hot and kind of popping them into the freezer to flash, you know, with the cover off to flash, kind of freeze them a little bit to bring that temperature down a little bit quicker. So properly cooled foods. And so I have properly cooled in italics there. So if you've done everything that you should do to make sure that your food was cooled within two hours, so it didn't spend too much time in that danger zone. Properly cooled foods can last for different amounts of time based on the rate at which bacteria is gonna grow in those foods. So um, whether or not the food is reheated before consumption is also a really important um, reminder of, I, I guess, how long something is gonna last. So for example, if you cook up a chicken breast in a stir fry and you're gonna reheat that stir fry in your uh, microwave and you're going to reheat it to a nice toasty temperature, um, nice and steamy, then it's a little bit, uh, you know, something like that will last a little bit longer in the refrigerator than something like an egg salad or an egg salad sandwich where you're not going to have any heating after that process. So of course, egg salad, chicken salads, tuna, those are the things that are going to last a little bit long or a little bit shorter time. And we do actually have a resource for you as well as to how long certain foods are going to be stored, can safely be stored in the fridge. Um, you know, and for even for like eggs, how long after you've hard boiled them, are they good in a shell, outside a shell? So we do have that resource there for you as well. And reheating your leftovers to 74 degrees. I know, again, like coming out with that thermometer is going to be a pain in the butt. But if you have a super sewer chili, make sure you're bringing it to a rolling boil. Um, and if you are nuking something in the microwave, just make sure it's nice and steamy um, when you're ready to eat it. So that's going to help to eliminate any bacteria that might still be lingering around. All right, so beware of some of the unregulated foods. I'm just going to touch base on some of the things that um, can become a little bit dangerous, just depending on uh, where they're coming from when you are immunocompromised. So some of these really healthy foods that we might be familiar with are important to avoid, especially during treatment. So unpasteurized food. So make sure when you're picking up honey um, or juices or anything like that in the fresh aisle, that they are things that are pasteurized, that are marked as pasteurized. Most of the things that we purchase in our grocery store are gonna be things that are pasteurized, but sometimes your imported cheeses, for example, that come from like Quebec might not be pasteurized. Um, the other, I guess the other example would be homemade mayos and salad dressings. Sometimes when you go to restaurants, they are doing these things from scratch. And so they'll have like a raw egg uh, yolk in that product. So just be a little bit conscious of that. Fermented foods like kombuchas, a lot of people are now doing locally produced uh, fermented foods like sauerkraut and kombucha. And the ones that are, are in the grocery store tend to be ones that do still have to be pasteurized to be on the shelf, but that's definitely something you want to be wary of. Um, unfortunately, we love to support local. We're all about supporting local, but um, the food, I guess the process in creating the food is just not as food safe, um, especially during treatment time. The same thing stands for fresh squeezed juices from restaurants and smoothie shops. Um, we just don't, it, where it's not a pasteurized product, um, you know, you don't have control over how much uh, or how food safe the individuals who are preparing the foods would be or, you know, what kind of exposure to bacteria might be in the air and all that kind of stuff. So it's just something that you can kind of pump the brakes on just for, um, you know, while your immune function is not as best. Of course, chili meats, sushi, and smoked meats. And I mean, the reason why we kind of, you know, dial back on these guys or say that they're an area where you have a, a little bit of risk come in is because again, we're not cooking that product. So it's not reaching a temperature that can kill a lot of the really common bacteria. And, you know, anybody should be wary <laughs> of kind of where their sushi and smoked meats and things like that are coming from. But especially when we're immunocompromised, we want to be careful with those items. All right. So the last few that we're gonna talk about, sprouts like alfalfa and bean sprouts, they're just a very common um, 
they're a very common source of foodborne illness, not for any particularly known reason. It's just a very common um, food for uh, for outbreaks for um, foodborne illness. So bean sprouts, you could certainly use them if you're gonna cook them like in a stir fry, but um, staying away from alfalfa and bean sprouts in a raw form in salads would be a good idea. Of course, buffet style restaurants that may have poor control of food temperatures. If you think about those hot holds that they have, um, you know, they have regulations on how, how warm foods are supposed to be. But uh, unfortunately, a lot of restaurants um, are not always keeping up on keeping their food temperatures. So while the things that are in the bottom of your bowls at the a uh, buffet style restaurant would might be really hot the top the surface of it can kind of get cool without um without a lot of a lot of regulation really of course breaks my heart but raw cookie dough or baking dough mixes certainly don't want to lick the whisk when it comes to a, a cake bake gail's smiling because <laughs> she probably she probably does hey yeah. <laughs> so again just something you want to be cautious of right now so yeah, these foods are all common offenders for uh, causing foodborne illness um, or foods that represent a significant risk to us. And we are going to, in our smoothie bowl, we are going to use a protein powder um, in ours. Now, if you have any protein powder that you have at home would be something that you could use. We are going to talk about a couple different alternatives if you would like to prefer not to use a protein powder, other ways that you can get proteins into your smoothie. But um, supplements and alternative health products, I would be remiss if I didn't talk to you about um, the NPN number and supplements as well. So of course, your best resource for information on herbals, supplements, all that type of stuff is always gonna be your cancer care team. Um, but I'm gonna just touch on a few points to consider. So even with approved supplements, uh, so for example, if your uh, physician or your cancer care team tells you it's okay to take a certain supplement, you should always check for what's called an NPN number on your product. So an NPN number is called a natural product number. And that basically tells us that Health Canada has certified that what's on the label of the product is actually what's in the label. So the supplement industry has been highly unregulated for a large period of time. And the NPN system has only uh, come in in the last 10 years or so. So it's a voluntary process right now. Not all supplements um, will have an NPN registration number. But if a company has an NPN number, you can be, I guess, kind of safe in assuming that, you know, Health Canada has done their background on it they make sure there's no false labels on the claim or no false claims on the labels but also that there's no heavy metals or no mystery products that are that are in in your supplement that are not listed on the label and it happens a lot lot more than than anyone but anybody might think so it is really important to look for that npn number so um, herbals as well, sometimes they can be a little bit sneaky. So herbals and excess vitamins may be added to some of the foods you already enjoy. Um, teas, so sometimes you might see like a sleepy time tea, um, you know, or a, uh, a smooth move laxative tea or something like that. It's always important to check the labels to see what's actually in that product because a lot of herbals do interact with our medications. Um, so knowing what, you know, knowing what uh, medications you're taking and making sure you're transparent with your care team on uh, what kind of supplements that you use is extremely important. Um, sometimes juices though, snacks and juices from the health food section might have certain things like spirulina or chlorophyll or, you know, natural herbals added to them like ginseng that again might not be things that drive well with your medications. Energy drinks are notorious for those as well. So if you're feeling really dragged out, if you're struggling to, to have good energy all the time, um, just be conscious if you're using energy drinks to check the labels and make sure they're not things that are going to kind of interact with what you're taking. And Fiber supplements, like if you were to use a psyllium fiber, fiber supplements, um, things like chia and flax are not quite high fiber enough to really cause a big impact, but a fiber supplement would certainly be something that can reduce, um, significantly reduce the effectiveness or absorption of your meds. So always separate those things two hours from your medications. And as I said here, different medications just might interact with your herbal. So anytime you start a new medication, um, you should always check if there's uh, natural herbals or teas or anything that you're using. So oh, we're going to speed right through. <laughs> if you haven't taken out your granola, I would say it would be certainly a good time. <laughs> it's definitely time to take that guy out. Um, we're just going to co cover a few more quick topics on supporting good digestion. So 
If you are not feeling super well, if your digestion is kind of wonky, bloating can happen, constipation can happen, happen, loose stools, upset stomach, nausea, all that stuff. Reducing the workload for your digestive uh, system is a good idea when it's compromised. So cooked veggies are definitely easier to digest than raw veggies. I've got a lovely little list of some super easy digest vegetables. So if they haven't been necessarily agreeing with your stomach or you're finding a lot of gas production, these guys are the most common veggies that are really good for, um, you know, gentle on the digestion, really easy to digest. Up or pureed veggies in soup are definitely easier to digest. So pureed soups are a great idea. If you're trying to get some veggies in there, you really feel like you haven't been able to do so. Um, definitely the most digestible way to get them in. Remember to chew your food as much as possible. I know there's <laughs> uh, there's probably some busy moms and dads that might be listening, and sometimes it might be tough when you have kids or young young children, infants, to you know to really have any time to yourself. Um, but chewing your food as much as possible reduces the workload of the stomach and the actual mechanical physical part of digestion. So, chewing your food. Um, and sitting in a more relaxed state can kind of help your digestion. Um, a lot of times when veggies are super non-palatable, uh, fruits can definitely give you almost everything that you can find in vegetables as well. So if you're finding that those are more appealing to you, um, fruits are certainly a great substitute. Um, and there's also, I guess, a little bit of misconception around sugar um, when it comes to sugar and cancer. Um, you know, sugar is definitely part of our, you know, carbohydrate family and carbohydrates are things that help us to fuel our body. So fruits are definitely not something that you need to avoid. And we'll talk a little bit more during the smoothie demo on uh, how, I guess, having fruits or sugars on their own versus sugars in combination with other things will, will treat your body a little bit better. So there's definitely some habits that can trigger the eye distress and some that can certainly aid. Uh, I know we just use a little bit of dry fruit here, but um, if you are finding that you're having a looser stool, you can always substitute dried fruits for something else in your uh, in your granola because mm. dried fruits can be high in sorbitol, normally prunes and dates, which of course most of us know are good things to help move your bowels. Um, sugar-free gums are also high in sorbitol, sorbitol or sugar alcohols in general. Um, so anything on your label that has an OL ending, um, sorbitol, maltitol, erythritol, mm. um, you know, some of these products can cause a looser stool. If you're kind of struggling with gas and bloating and loose stools, that would be something you could kind of avoid. Excess caffeine as well, even though uh, I know caffeine is a good energy boost. And separating, if you're struggling with reflux in particular um, or indigestion, separating large amounts of water by about a half an hour from your actual meals can improve your digestion. You can have like a small sipping glass with a meal, but basically when we're taking in a ton of water at the same time, we're diluting down those acids that help our body to break down proteins. And we're also creating more volume in the stomach and the more volume in the stomach, um, you know, that's that can be triggering for reflux as well. And consuming fruit, if you consume fruit before a meal, sometimes like if you're having uh, proteins like chicken and salads and things like that, if you're consuming especially fruit, beef. especially beef, if you consume fruit before your meal, it's a lot easier on your digestion than having a piece of fruit after a meal with like a heavy to digest protein. And Gail's just talking to you guys a little bit about ginger, but ginger, lemon, and peppermint can all be really soothing on the stomach. Um, and of course, she mentioned that, you know, it can help you to reduce nausea. You can include it in your cooking like we just did with your uh, granola. You can also use it as a tea. Deep fried and high fat meals are really tough on your digestion too, especially if your digestive system is already kind of inflamed and upset with us. So opt for air fried foods or even popping fries and chicken fingers in the oven is definitely a better, uh, a better way to go about it. And my last tip there, sitting in a relaxed state as often as you can. Like I said, I know it's not always realistic, but sitting in a relaxed state can definitely help your body to focus on the task at hand and allow it to really uh, have, a, have a better digestive experience. All right, and the last little thing, hydration. So just gonna touch on this because if you are experiencing some vomiting or diarrhea, we can become dehydrated fairly quickly. So aside from putting water back in the body, which we know we have to do, our body also loses electrolytes, your salt, potassium, magnesium, and calcium through your GI symptoms. So consuming foods with electrolytes in addition to water can help us to stay hydrated. And when you're dehydrated, actually, that's one of the bigger impactors on our body's uh, you know, sense of energy as well. Um, when you have low energy in the afternoon, a lot of times people are just dehydrated from mm -hmm. their day. So it's definitely something important to keep in mind on. And if you're finding that you're really snacky, it can also be a trigger because your body will try to 
trigger your hunger as opposed to get all trigger you. with your with your thirst. Yeah. So if you find that you're like, you know, ravenously hungry and you just eat it, it's probably because you're dehydrated. So how to add electrolytes naturally. If you're making a lot of food from scratch at home, you do need to add salt. Most of our bad, we'll say bad salt, or most of our salt that uh, people are concerned about uh, is coming from like pre-prep products, like, you know, uh, microwave pizzas and, uh, you know, pre-made soups and things like that. So it's important to actually salt your food if your foods are homemade, because we do need some sodium in there to help us retain some fluid. Eat foods like potato, banana, and cucumber for potassium. If you like dairy products, all of your dairy products or your fortified milk alternatives will definitely help you provide some calcium. And coconut water is a great little thing you can splash into a smoothie as well. It has a nice tropical flavor, but it's a really good source of electrolyte. Of course, if you do have severe vomiting or diarrhea, definitely, I mean, Pedialyte and oral rehydration solutions are obviously the answer then, but definitely um, something you could chat with the doctor about. Oh. I have this guy in our presentation. So it is a great little rehydration or recovery smoothie if you've gone through like a bout of a lot of, um, a lot of vomiting, a lot of diarrhea, that type of thing. This is just a great, really simple little uh, smoothie that's quick, easy to pop together. It's got the ginger in there to soothe the stomach and some banana and cucumber coconut water to help rehydrate. So we're gonna get right back to the smoothie. We're gonna get right back to the food demo. We're just gonna do a little switch over now of our uh, camera again. <laughs> I hope everybody's granola turned out well. <laughs> Sound good? And your peaches and everything look delicious. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. I just mute myself so. It's possible. Yeah. All right, we're back. Your camera's on its side, so we're it's not on the right angle. Your guys are kind of upside down a bit. Are we upside down? Yeah. Is that better? Excellent. Okay. Perfect. So again, you guys, I'm going to provide that slideshow and I've got a few resources for you on, on food, uh, food temps. And uh, if you do have any questions about any of that stuff afterwards, we can certainly chat through it. So if you guys are um, making the smoothie with us, you can grab a blender. This is another I like the smoothie recipe a lot just because it's a little bit different than what people typically do when they're adding in bananas or they're adding in, um, you know, berries. Um, a lot of times the tropical fruit gets overlooked, but a lot of the tropical fruits such as pineapple do contain um, uh, different things like a bromelain, which is really nice for your digestion as well. Um, and, and they've got lots of fiber. Um, and in a smoothie, you'll definitely find that it's a bit more um, palatable to break down as well. So for digestion. Um, and a lot of times, if you're having, if you have any sores in your mouth, having, um, you know, soreness of the mouth, a, a really nice cold smoothie is awesome. So uh, get your blender out. This is my Vitamix, which will blend up rocks if I asked it to. But you don't have to have a high powered blender for this. Um, you can just use, you know, your magic bullet or your ninja or whatever you've got on hand. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna add in. So what I always do with my smoothies is that I always add in my liquid first. And if you are gonna be making a smoothie recipe and we have a great resource, we have a great smoothie recipe list that we can also provide you guys. So if you wanna try a few different kinds, there's lots of good ones on there. Um, but what I, if so, what I like to always do is add in my liquid first. And if you are making, say, a green smoothie, so if you're doing something with spinach or kale or anything like that, you definitely want to add in your liquid and your spinach and blend that first um, because that will help pulverize it. And then you can add the rest of your ingredients. Otherwise, I find sometimes you get those spinach <laughs> chunks, which nobody wants in a smoothie. I did that for my kids one time and they were a uh, roast out. <laughs> so I've I've, uh, I've learned the trick is to blend, almost, almost like you're making like a spinach soup, which yeah. sounds gross, but 
um, tastes delicious. So I'm using, this is a oat milk. Um, so this guy here is uh, great for getting your calcium in. If you're not, if you're avoiding dairy, but you can always use dairy milk as well. You can oh, use uh, almond milk, okay. cashew milk is really nice in this recipe because it's really creamy. Um, anything like that is good. What I love about oat milk is if you are trying to keep your calories up, if you're mm -hmm. struggling to keep weight on, the oat milk has the higher calorie value. Yeah. Same thing as the cashew milk. So it's a great way to add in some extra calories. Yeah, more calories and it's really creamy and just makes a delicious smoothie. So this is gonna be about a cup. So this would be about, oh, my cat has gone behind my, <laughs> behind my um, sink. Um, so this is gonna be about like a single serve. So you can always double or triple this if you've got kids at home that want smoothies as well. Smoothies is also, I try and get my kids to have them as much as I can because it's definitely like, my kids are now seven and nine and they just want to, um, you know, in the morning they want to play video games before school, they don't want to get ready. So if I make them a smoothie, I can at least know that they're getting protein, they're getting healthy fat, and they just think that they're having fruit and milk. So uh, if you've got a picky eater or if you yourself are a picky eater, it's a good way to sneak in a lot of great nutrition. Um, and like I said, it's great digestion wise. So we've got our milk in here now. Um, so this is the fruit that I'm using. I'm using frozen fruit and don't ever be, um, don't ever think that frozen is less healthy than fresh. A lot of the times, especially where we live in Canada, um, frozen is like actually your better choice. Like to get a peach or a pineapple or a mango now. Um, picked at its prime ripeness. Picked at its prime <laughs> ripeness, just say in Costa Rica. By the time it gets here, it could be three weeks to a month. Yeah. And then it might sit on a grocery store shelf for another week. So you've got five weeks gone by. Most of the, well, almost 50% of the nutri nutrients in them. So, so a lot of fruit is made up of B vitamins. A lot of those B vitamins are gonna um, be depleted just over time with exposure to, light. exposure to light and heat and all that kind of stuff. So frozen fruit, I always have a few bags of frozen fruit in my freezer. And plus you don't have to add ice into your smoothie, just makes it, makes it perfect. Yeah, so this is too much. I'm gonna add in about a cup, but I'm gonna add in the rest after to show you how to make the sort of like the smoothie bowl. So about a cup goes in. So a cup of liquid, a cup of fruit. Yeah. Good so reason. a lot of times people will stop there or if you were like me in university and you thought you were eating really super healthy, but you were not, um, you were probably, you would probably put like a fat-free yogurt with, you know, fake sugar in it. You don't want that. Uh, you wanna have as much nutrition in here. There's nothing wrong with a 350 calorie or more smoothie in the morning. Um, it's the start of your day. You want to get, you know, you want to get started on the right foot. If you're trying to gain weight, again, loads of ways we can enhance. Loads of ways you can Tons enhance of calories it. In here. Lots of calories in there, and you can sip on it, and um, away you go. So your fruit and your milk are in here. Um, so we can talk a bit about protein. So we're adding a protein powder today, but there's definitely, so again, really important. You can use any type of protein powder that you like if you want to use a protein powder, but make sure that somewhere on the front of that package, you see that nine digit NPN number. And there are this alternatives. You can also do, this is a plant-based protein. This is a plant, so it's done with pea. And this one here itself, if, you're, if you do have a lot of uh, GI uh, concerns, if you're having a lot of digestive issues, um, Sometimes people find that the plant proteins are a little easier, especially if they're, if, if it says on the label fermented pea is what it'll usually say. So that means it's just broken down a little bit more for you. Um, and I find them really easy on my digestive tract. Um, so yeah, so a, a fermented pea protein is kind of what you'll be looking for. Um, you can also do alternative. You can do a Greek yogurt if dairy is sitting well. Make sure that your Greek yogurt has more than more than 10 grams of protein in there. Lots of them have like 15 to 20 grams of protein, which is lovely. Um, you can also use silk and tofu, so really soft tofu. You can use those in a smoothie. It usually makes it nice and thick and whippy. Really good source of plant-based protein um, and really doesn't taste like a whole lot. Yeah. So we've got our carbs basically from our fruits. Oh, hello, my dog is back. <laughs> it's a zoo here today. We've got our carbs from our fruit and a little bit from our um, oat milk. And now we just added in our protein. So we need to have one more layer. Um, so we're gonna add in some fat, which most people, and I remember when I first started adding in fats to my smoothies, I thought this is weird, what am I doing? But oh my goodness, the difference it makes. You, you're full for so much longer. Um, it's going to help you absorb um, your some fat-soluble vitamins. Fat vitamins, your A's, your D, your K, all those things. 
So it is really important and there's different ways you can add in your uh, fats. So With that how to build a smoothie handout that we're going to give you guys, um, we'll just, it'll, it'll show us a couple different ones, but avocado, nut butter is a great way to enter or to add some fats in there. And even when you're trying to keep it really simple, a teaspoon of olive oil of, of like uh, just extra virgin olive oil can be a great way to add a healthy oil. fat in there or coconut oil. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, so today I'm, this is actually, I think I put cashews or cashew butter on your, um, on your ingredients. I actually ran out of it, I didn't realize. So I'm using a peanut butter. This is actually called Fat Soul Peanut Butter. It's a Canadian brand. Um, if you're local to a Simply for Life, you can probably get it there. You can order it online as well. Um, it's really great because it does contain different kinds of fats, hence the name. It's got things like chia, flax. It's got uh, tapioca fiber, which is a great prebiotic fiber. It has um, coconut oil, macadamia nut oil, I think. Anyway, it's delicious. I call it tropical peanut butter because it does have a little bit of a coconutty flavor. Um, but any type of nut butter is fine. And, uh, or you can also do what I like to do sometimes in smoothies and it makes them extra creamy, especially if you're gonna do like a smoothie bowl. Um, soak some cashews. So about a quarter of a cup of cashews raw, non-salted cashews, soak them in boiling water for about 30 minutes. They plump right up. And that will also help to digest a bit easier and it just gives you some really nice healthy fats. So this is, this is like almost two tablespoons here, but feel free to add more less, or less. Less or more, depending on if you're trying to, uh, trying to consume some extra calories and keep some weight on. Um, tablespoon is, you know, it's a good, good serving too, if you're a little bit more mindful of calories. And again, we're going to add in our, another little bit of fat plus, um, I don't like the term superfoods. Um, I think it's sort of like a dated term, but I find like things like chia and flax, I would really constitute them as like a super food. There's so many good things. So many good things in them, the fat, um, calcium, iron. chia, yeah, chia contains like 30% of your day's calcium in a tablespoon, um, iron as well. So some things that maybe if your diet is lacking in them because you haven't been able to eat very well lately or don't have much of an appetite or you've been, you know, like, like a lot of vomiting, that kind of thing. Um, definitely getting in some of these guys uh, into a smoothie is, is a great option. So again, this is an Epicare. This is called Cacao Crunch. It's got a few other things in it. It's got chia and, and psyllium. It's got a bit of coconut and some, um, a few other little things. Um, but you can just use straight up like a you can go from a teaspoon all the way up to a tablespoon of chia or flax or psyllium. Um, psyllium now, it all depends. If you're dealing with some constipation, you might want to stick with the chia and the flax. Yeah. If you're having a looser lot of stool. looser stool, um, stick with the psyllium. Stick with the psyllium, yeah. Um, but probably don't go psyllium if you're constipated. <laughs> you won't enjoy that. So you can do like a tablespoon, like, a, like I said, teaspoon, tablespoon. Here we go. And so now we've got our carbs from our fruit, we've got our protein from the protein powder, we've got our liquid, we've got our fats from the nut butter, and now we've got some fiber and now we have a complete smoothie. This is probably much different than the smoothies you made before, but it tastes amazing. So I'm sorry, everybody. It's going to get loud. <laughs> it's going to be loud. The Vitamixes are loud. <laughs> So while you're making your smoothie, um, we did get a couple questions in. Yes, I thought this might be a good time for me to throw them at you guys. Um, so someone asked about uh, foods that increase iron. They said that they have to have um, uh, blood transfusions often. So they were looking for foods that would help like boost up their, their iron. Okay, so I mean, Red meats are your are your first, of course. Your red meats are your first, but a lot of foods and seafood. Yeah, um, and like scallops and scallops, mussels, oysters are really high in iron. Um, and uh, your chia is you know, chia, chia is one of your better options. Yep. 
And um, if you if you can tolerate chickpeas, so like chickpea pasta, you can get at the grocery store. So a lot of your beans and lentils are really good sources of iron. Um, but some, sometimes the trouble is to get a lot of, you know, you'd have to have like a full cup or a cup and a half to really get a good dose. But the chickpea um, pasta, chickpea lentil pasta, I think you can get at Costco. Chickpea um, is the brand name, yeah. but there's lots of them out there now. But it's, it's quite concentrated, actually. Like when they turn it into a pasta, it, had a, it has a much higher... Um, iron yeah, content. I think it almost says 50% of your day. Yeah. There's a lot of fortified cereals as well. Absolutely. Fortified cereals and, you know, there are some fortified milk alternatives yeah. out there as well. Yeah. And if you do the chickpea pasta, we're always looking for if you have a plant-based iron, a vitamin C source with it to help you absorb it best. So having a tomato sauce on your chickpea pasta is a great way to get some in. Yeah. Awesome. That's great. Uh, we got two more questions yes. uh, come in. So someone asked about, um, uh, vegetarian foods that can help increase weight. So they don't eat meat, but they're looking for like, uh, foods that pack a lot of calories. Your nut butters and your coconut and your coconut milk, like coconut cream and stuff. Mm -hmm. Those guys are your best friends. So I um, mean, carbs, you definitely get, you know, a good source of carbs when you're eating plant-based because a lot of your plant-based mm -hmm. proteins would have high carb as well. Um, making sure that you're getting enough protein for, you know, supporting weight as well is really important. So mm -hmm. mung beans and edamame beans are some of your highest protein, even with a low carb, they have a very low carb value to them, but they're extremely high in protein. Yeah. Um, but those healthy fats are a fantastic vehicle to build up those calories. So your nut butters, um, you know, nut butters are basically a concentrated source of your nuts, right? So yeah. um, coconut cream is another good, like adding coconut uh, cream to yeah. two different uh, dishes as well and yeah. lentil, you know, into uh, dal and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, your beans and your peas and all that kind of stuff as well yeah. and um, and a smoothie just like this so you can yeah. you can you can up where you can pump up a ton of calories in a smoothie yeah yeah even the silken tofu and a smoothie yeah. is a really good option you won't even notice that it's there and uh you know eat, if you can tolerate some dairy like some uh like grass-fed cheese and things like yeah. that is if you're, if you're eating vegetarian is a good option as well totally yeah awesome thank you and then the last question was about turmeric so you mentioned um ginger as being you know a good spice to add but they were wondering about you know they heard a lot about turmeric being you know an anti-inflammatory um you know super food or whatever you want to call it um what's a good way to incorporate turmeric into dishes so my favorite thing for turmeric you know, gail might have a different thought is a turmeric latte i also love okay lattes. yeah so you can take like an oat milk or something like we just put together put a know. teaspoon of honey um you can use powdered ginger and then also your powdered turmeric um, ginger and turmeric go really, really well together. Add a little bit of cinnamon. You can bring all of that to a boil in a little pot on the stove. And it is a fantastic way to be able to get a good bit in there. Nice and easy on the tummy. As and well. you can also be super lazy and get one of these guys, <laughs> which is a turmeric latte. This is organic traditions. We have this at our clinic. I don't know if the other Simply for Life's would, but they are you can Dominion. I've seen them at, yeah, Dominion. I saw them at Bulk Burn recently. You could probably order them online. So Organic Traditions is the brand. This is the turmeric latte here itself. Um, <laughs> this one has also has coconut milk powder. It's got turmeric, ginger, cinnamon. Um, it's got some probiotics and some prebiotics. So something like this is awesome. So just mix and go. <laughs> just literally put it in with your milk and away you go, or you can add it into like a smoothie or anything like that. So yeah, if anyone is. This is, I love it. So cooking, cooking with turmeric is, is fantastic, but I mean, turmeric has a very specific flavor. Mm -hmm. So having turmeric like in every dish might be a difficult thing to do, but this might be like an easier way to kind of get a little bit of turmeric in here and there. It's really nice, like on a cold evening or something, like, or even the first thing in the morning, like warm it up with your milk and your non dairy milk or whatever you're using and away you go. Yeah. Ooh, awesome. Thank you so much. So I'll get, uh, let you get back to your smoothie. Okay. we got a couple minutes. Yeah. Well, I'll just show you um, how I'm gonna, so this is the smoothie itself. So it's very nice and runny. And and so you can sort of, you can make it your own. Like again, with the granola, you can do, um, you can make it um, your own flavors. Your own flavors. You can add in different fruits. You can add in some banana, whatever you like. But if you wanna make a thicker, like almost like a bowl of ice cream, uh, I'm just gonna bump up the, the fruit a little bit. So I'm actually gonna add in some more frozen fruit because the stuff I have here is, <laughs> Is melted. <laughs> so always have some frozen fruit and some frozen veg in your freezer. 
gonna add another half a cup, you said? Oh, almost a cup, yeah. And you, you can almost just split this with people, but it is, it's a nice way if you're trying to put some weight back on. I'm leaving all the poor strawberries in here. <laughs> I have to make a peanut butter and jam smoothie. That's a good one. Frozen strawberries, nut milk, peanut butter, chia, blend it up. PB and J. PB and J. <laughs> Okay. All right, so it is going to get loud. Loud again, sorry. <laughs> Turn your volume down. Turn your volume down, yeah. So normally it might be a little bit thicker than this too, but my first bit of frozen fruit was a little bit um was a little bit thought out, but you get the idea. So and you don't have to have an adorable coconut bowl, but if you really want one, I got these from Amazon. Um, yeah, it's just a nice way to enjoy um, like an ice cream, but you're gonna get a lot more nutrition into that. And you can top it like with what you like. So I'm gonna do like a sprinkle of this to make it look really nice. And that's the uh, and that actually that actually has turmeric in it, guys. This Epicure Tutti Fruity. So if you're looking to, I feel like we're doing enough your show. I know. <laughs> you I love their stuff. I should sell it. <laughs> no, it is good stuff though. I like it. And so yeah, you can do that. You can chop up some fresh berries on it, or you can put a little bit more. I'm just trying to make it look fancy for you. Obviously, you don't have to make it look fancy. You can just dig right in. But if you want to, you want someone in your house to eat it who doesn't really like this kind of stuff. If you make it look pretty, maybe they'll eat it. <laughs> so that's part of it. You so we've got our fruit that. there. And then we'll do, this is where you can do your granola. Now you don't have to have granola in this. Um, you can use your granola for anything really. Yeah. It's great. It's just like a, like a snack. Yeah. You can always toss them in a little bowl of uh, almond milk or regular mm -hmm. milk if you want to. It's a, like a high energy density um, snack. Well, well gosh, we have our lovely little bowl. Oh, how cute does it look? Can you guys see that? <laughs> it's very yummy. So, um, yeah. So between everything we have in that smoothie um, and you're adding granola, your fruit, all those extras, I mean, it's really easy to turn a smoothie bowl into something that can well, be you can do a, a little meal bit, and a half. A little <laughs> drizzle of nut butter in there. You can go for it. Whatever you like, whatever flavors you like. All right, I'm gonna have to try it for you. <laughs> it's gonna have to be, um, I'll be your taste tester. Mm -hmm. So you'll have to let us know how your granola worked out. Mm -hmm. That's delicious. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. So yeah, if you guys have any other questions, you can pop them in the, the Q&A section there, but I will send on to uh, Charlotte a little package with some smoothie recipes, a how to build your smoothie, some resources on uh, food safety, and everything we talked about today. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, thank you both so much. I really appreciated uh, Gail and Robin for you guys taking the time to chat with us today um, about food and all the important nutrients. Um, I will remind anybody who's on um, on the session that if you ever have any questions or looking for any additional information when it comes to um, nutrition and food, you can uh, send us an email, info at bloodcancers.ca or give us a call at 1-833-222-4884. Um, we will be sending uh, some additional resources. Uh, thanks to Robin and Gail and Simply for Life St. John's. Um, and then lastly, just again, wanna send a thank you to Estella for um, uh, providing the funding to do this uh, session. So thank you so much. And I uh, hope you all have a safe and wonderful rest of your day. Thanks guys. Thanks. <laughs>